UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Um, and I just have to give a special shout out. Uh, when we started Unseen Latinas, uh, we, you know, sometimes you ask people for help and you ask for a little help, but uh, we have relied so heavily on the research done and, and the presentations done by Sonia and her colleagues um, that we're hoping in this next year we find a permanent home for the Unseen Latinas initiative at UCLA through our budget priorities. Um, just giving a little shout out to that early. Um, be, we have some money next year um, and we want to make sure that this uh, keeps going, that this goes beyond these members. And, and so, it, you know, I have never seen an organization, research organization step up and provide us with so many resources and be such a critical aspect of that. So thank you, Sonia, and please take us home. That's really sweet and exciting because I know that my faculty colleagues have participated in every hearing um, this legislative session and I think that's tremendous because we need more. I think one of the things when we think about Latinas, they're either a monolith um, or they are invisible. And so this Unseen Latinas initiative has given light to the different contours from the law to media and entertainment to workers and the strong role that Latinas play in Latino households in shaping America. Um, I'm gonna provide some quick data points for you and I'm also gonna speak to what assembly member um, I think both uh, Reginald John Sawyer and then also Assemblymember Eloise Gomez Reyes asked, which is what we can do. And I think that's where we should be headed. So these are my contributors. The person in the middle, Cassandra Hernandez, is the one who authored the Exiting the Workforce Report on Latina. She is now an incoming PhD student at UC Berkeley in the Economics Department. Um, we're going to quickly talk about the state of Latinas in the U.S. workforce. We're going to discuss why they dropped out of the workforce and why this is really sounding the alarm bells for all policymakers. Why their economic contributions matter and then ultimately to the last point, what is it that we can do as stakeholders and as legislators? Um, you know, some of the data, COVID-19 essentially decimated black and brown communities. It was not the great equalizer. And what's important here is that it was very harmful for Latinas. What this shows is that after the pandemic induced shutdowns, right, the closures to business, leisure, hospitality, Latinas experienced the highest unemployment rate. This was 20.2%, more than any other racial, ethnic group, gender, et cetera. And what's terrible is that as we continue to move forward from COVID-19 into the variants, into a post-pandemic reality that still we have not met yet, California is much further along than the rest of the country, Latinas remain at the highest level of unemployment. Now, during the peak pandemic, Latinas left the labor force. When I describe this, I think it's important that leaving the labor force is like dropping out of college. It's gonna take that much more to get somebody in, and the reason that this matters for Latinas is that they're youthful. They're leaving the labor force not because they're close to retirement, they're in their peak workforce. This is the prime of their careers. And so Latinas exited the workforce at a rate that was nearly double than white women. Again, Latinas are the current and future workforce. They also are the breadwinners of Latino households despite the equal pay gap. So this is not just something that is affecting Latino households, it's all American households because we saw from the 2020 data from the census, there's only one demographic group that is not growing, and that's white Americans. So our economy is predicated on workers of color, America's new majority. Now, over the course of the pandemic, Latinas, you know, they essentially experienced the largest drop in labor force, and so this is them exiting. We're a year out, and it has not recovered. And so we hear about how there are a lot of businesses that can't fill their jobs well, one of the things is thinking about why those jobs um, are not worth it. So many Latinos, especially in California, left their house every day to put their lives and the lives of their family members on the line so that they could have a roof over their head and food on their table. These were not jobs that provided the retirement security benefits, the sick paid leave, the health care that's quality. So ultimately, getting those workers back is going to be incumbent on us having good jobs, including good union jobs. Um, I, I kind of touched on this, but Latinas were overrepresented in vulnerable low-wage work. 
And so this is a this is a bar chart that's showing you the women's share of population versus their share of leisure and hospitality industry based on racial ethnic status. So you're seeing that Latinas are overrepresented compared to their share of the US population. This is also true for black women. And so these are vulnerable industries. We saw throughout today's hearing the role of being on the front lines, the sexual assaults, the sexual harassment, and the gross um, unequal economic um, deprivation that occurs for these women workers. Now, here's another thing that's really important, and this is something that if the infrastructure bill is passed through the US Congress will really be a game changer. Latinas spent more time on family care versus their male peers. So the lack of having affordable child care or elder care, paid sick leave, you name it, meant that it was almost um, better in terms of uh, social utility to stay home than go to work. And it was just unacceptable to have to put your life on the line when you did not have access to a provider. I know thinking about you, um, Assembly Member Gomez Reyes, and in the role of the Inland Empire and the lack of providers there in hospitals, are you going to go to work for a job that is not paying you and not giving you sick leave and put your kids at risk while schools are closed? We should not be making workers in their most productive years make those choices, especially women workers. Um, now, here's something in terms of thinking about the opportunity, and this is not just an opportunity for Latinos, this is not an opportunity for California, Texas, and Florida, this is an opportunity to grow the American economy. There is no US economy without Latinas. So the Latino Donor Collaborative for the last four years has created a remarkable report called the Latino Gross Domestic Product. They um, were able to calculate that this year just came out in September, uh, if Latinos in the U.S. were their own country, they would be the seventh largest GDP in the world. They're responsible for adding $2.7 trillion. So when we think about the American Recovery Act, when we think about the infrastructure spending, that is Latinos year after year. Um, one of the things that's important is that they are the growth economy. They're going to continue to grow. Again, when we think about the demographic that is not growing, that is unsustainable. One of the things that drives this economic growth is labor force participation. So this is something that is important, but also on the line, given Latinas are exiting the workforce. So by 2029, our research at UCLA um, anticipates that Latinas would be responsible for almost 10% of the US workforce. Now, what's important here is, is that the number of Latinas in the labor force is projected to grow at nine times the rate of their white female peers. And so they need to be employed in good jobs, right? Good jobs to have disposable income, to grow the economy, to continue to consume, purchase goods and services. Now, what can government do to help? A lot, there, and there's a lot of opportunity given the robust um, resources. So public sector investments that meet the moment include increasing the federal minimum wage. This just has to happen. Um, one of the things when I think about the great state of California and the way in which we're able to vote for our elected representatives, in some ways it's paradoxical to places like Florida, who vote differently top of the ticket but have passed through ballot initiatives a $15 minimum wage. Um, enfranchisement and voting rights for those that were formerly incarcerated. And so sometimes we can learn something by looking east, but ultimately we have the opportunity and the obligation to shape what happens west eastward. And so with that, some of the other things are really thinking about early childhood care, which I know the state of California invested a lot this last legislative cycle, um, making sure that people and households are aware of this child tax credit. So even though we create things, there still needs to be the trusted messengers, whether it's the unions or the hopes or the Manas San Diego's of the world that can actually get that message out and ensure people apply. Um, and then ultimately, we need to reinforce state and local laws that specifically prohibit discrimination. Enforcement's a big issue. So we continue to have collateral consequences in discriminatory enforcement around our undocumented workers who are on the front lines doing essential work, but we're not investing the same amount as the federal government in OSHA in making sure that there are safe places that people are actually not being victims of wage theft. So there needs to be an imbalance that is corrected there so that it balances out and grows our economy. Um, I just wanna close and say thank you. I think that we all have a role to play in this and if we don't do something now, we all will be screwed. Thanks. Thank you. Can you put the last slide up? And I want you to stay there because I know there's going to be questions. I'm going to just start by saying this. You know, sometimes I get frustrated because if you look at the things we've done and some of the things that are suggested, we've done it. You know, we've said you can't ask about prior 
um, salary. Salary. We've said there's got to be some transparency. We worked on the bill with um, so much of it. We worked with uh, our former Senator Hannah Jackson, who really led the way on a lot of this stuff. You know, we've expanded paid leave. We've increased the minimum wage. I mean, you name it, we've done it, right? We continue to lead, and yet California is further behind and continue to fall even farther behind than the rest of the nation. And during this pandemic, um, I mean, with the numbers, you'll see, you know, uh, Latinas nationwide were about 55 cents of the dollar. They're now 57. I, I think that's probably because some of the states that lifted the minimum wage probably helped and probably Latinas who dropped out of the workforce changed the numbers, unfortunately, on some of that. But even in California, where that happened, um, we're still at 42 cents. So what uh, it's frustrating because yeah. in some ways it's like, what are we doing wrong? And I do think that, that there is discrimination, but when we look at our sisters who are African-American, they, I would argue face the same, if not more discrimination, at least equal discrimination as Latinas. So like, what is it? Like, what can we do? Um, why is California falling so yeah. far behind? Well, I think that California is falling behind because we're growing income inequality. And so it's a tale of the riches, which in, endeavored this huge surplus. But with that, we have to be creative. So the universal strategy in California is not the strategy that we need to rely fully on. We need to think about targets. So when you talk about, you know, we've done all of these things, I, I think about the COVID-19 pandemic. So sure, we had a lot of vaccines, but there was a lot of work to do to make sure that those vaccines actually got to frontline essential workers. And so there, what was required is community clinics and that infrastructure, community-based organizations and trusted messengers. Um, so I think that the target in the centering needs to go on the populations first and foremost versus letting it first in time. That's not gonna work. And then the second thing is that we need to continue to double down in growing our civil society infrastructure. Ultimately, with the spread of disinformation and misinformation, we're seeing that people's trust in government is not where it needs to be, and those not, are not always the best messengers. But if you go to work sites or if you're going to community organizations, um, if you're going to schools, schools are a really good site for reaching Latino families and Asian American families because they're youthful, that could provide an opportunity. And so I think it's just the amount of targeting and then ensuring you have the people and the boots on the ground that can get that message so that people go from access to actually applying and um, matriculating into any sort of government program. Thank you. Are there additional? I'm sure there's additional questions. Christina and then Eloise. I think just more of a comment on your last set of your response um, with the vaccine in particular. I want to make it clear to those listening that there are groups on the ground who are doing the work and are the respected and trusted messengers. I think we have a system within our government that tries to force a model that doesn't work within what we have. And so I think we need to first and foremost rethink that uh, instead of saying that there's nothing there uh, when we need that infrastructure, whether it's to get vaccines out PP or even information about our rights that are out there. Uh, and so definitely interested in ideas of how we start to change that narrative from our position uh, so that we're putting to work the resources that we have. We are a resource-rich community out there. But when you talk to folks where we're at, they're like, there's just nothing available. I'm like, well, there's nothing available in the way that it's always been done, but that hasn't worked for us. And so within that, what are some recommendations that you might have for us? So I think this is important, right? And I, I think about the past 19 months that we've all experienced in this collective psyche that has transformed the way that we live, work, and even play. Um, and so we need to remember that COVID-19 is not the last crisis. We're gonna continue to have wildfires. We've seen that for the last four years. We don't know what other public epidemic is gonna be there. We know we have gross housing insecurity. And so how can we stabilize our civil society sector so that they can be responsive for this research heavy um, jurisdiction that we're in so those resources actually penetrate? Some of the things I think about is that, you know, there are times where digital matters and there's times where digital first doesn't. And so when you have access to something so vital that is life or death purely based on internet and a system that is not culturally competent, or easy to use and something that maybe is easy for 20 year olds and 30 year olds, then we're missing the mark. Um, and that's why you're still gonna need, obviously, that mobilization. I do a lot of work on voting rights and um, electoral engagement. 
you cannot do phone calls and SMS as the only way to reach people. You need to door knock. You need to ensure that you're meeting people where they are, especially if they're first time voters or low propensity voters. Use that analogy for any sort of government crises response in the future. All right, young organizers, not all by text. <laughs> Eloise? I love hearing that because that's exactly what we're, the older, the older generation talks about is the door knocking. Uh, something you said I, I th really resonated. You said some of those jobs just aren't worth it. Our, our, our Latinas are realizing that they're, they're being abused. Um, it, 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 they're being used in a way that is, that is wrong. And they now are hearing about all these other jobs and realize they're, they're giving up their family time. They're giving up so much for those menial jobs. So I appreciate that. Um, you, you've talked about growing our civil society sector. It's, it's a new phrase for me. Please tell us more about that. Yeah, so this can be major social um, services agencies, like in Oakland, California, it would be the Unity Council um, in the Fruitvale. Service agencies that receive federal funds or state funds to do work on, you can think about um, child care, senior citizens, affordable housing, um, Head Start. Those are places that during the pandemic were essentially transitioning from those services to giving people food and cash assistance. Now, in addition, there's the civil society community-based organizations at a regional level, right? There could be people um, like CLRA, or you can think about, you know, um, you know, I think about Mana, I think about Hope, I also think about places that do work for youth engagement. There's a lot of different places that have been made possible because of social policy through the federal government and state government, but they're not government. But the great thing is, oftentimes, they're BIPOC-led and they're being led by people in the community, especially when you're dealing with youth and you're dealing with housing, low-income affordable housing. So those are places to invest so that they can get the message out. One of the things that I think is really important when we, when we position this within our culture and our community and the history of Latinos always being here, one of the greatest outcomes of the Latino movement was the community health care and public health fights. Because we still now went from access to social services, poverty alleviation, to this robust network of community clinics who are not only providing health care but are telling people when to vote, how to register to vote, right? With the Affordable Care Act, that became a huge political fight. It's still not over through the courts, but that's a place where you want to engage these patients and you can disseminate information because there's a threshold. You know that those are going to be low-income patients or they're patients that are medically and linguistically underserved. Thank you. Yeah. If I may, with Vanessa from Hope. Thank you all. Thank you. Vanessa, you talked about this report that you all...